In our worship at Saudi congregation, we've got lots of visitors this morning. We're glad you're here. We hope you'll stay around after worship and uh, let us get to know you. I've got a few announcements that I'm going to go through. Um, I'm not going to go through everything in the bulletin. The bulletins are on the uh, uh, table in the foyer, but I'm going to go through a, a few things here. Um, just a reminder to the men that tomorrow night is Men's Devo. It's at 7 p.m. And uh, who's teaching, Brian? Jerry Corbin. Jerry Corbin is going to be teaching. All right, Jerry's hiding over there from us. Um, Jerry's going to be teaching. If you haven't been coming to the Men's Devo, uh, it's a very good time of uplifting. Um, very encouraging series we've been doing this year. Um, also, it is shower time. Not for the whole congregation, but we've got... Um, We've got three showers that are coming up. Uh, there's a baby shower for Reagan Perkins on April 27th at 1030 in the fellowship room. Uh, information on where she's registered is in the bulletin. There's also a bridal shower for Hannah Masterson on Saturday, May 18th from 2 to 4 in the fellowship room. Again, registration information is in the bulletin. And then we uh, have another baby shower. We love having new babies here at this congregation. Uh, Robert and Nicole Ingram uh, are expecting a little girl in June, and there's a list of needed items on the table in the foyer, and there's a table set up in the fellowship room uh, for the Ingrams. So um, if you will, participate in that. Also, uh, the new quarter is coming up in May, and we are in need of some teachers. Uh, we were starting early this time asking for teachers. If you're interested in teaching if you're interested in co-teaching uh, maybe you haven't taught a class before and you would be willing to co-teach just to kind of get your feet wet a little bit see Lisa or myself or Brian and we'll be glad to uh, to get you involved in that there are sign-up sheets in the hallway uh, the long hallway uh, in the, near the restrooms uh, for those who would be willing to teach or co-teach uh, also, there is a Secret Sister program that is starting, and there are forms on the front table in the foyer uh, for the Secret Sister program. Um, the, uh, there's not a deadline. The names will be drawn after morning services on April 7th for the Secret Sister program. Also, uh, there's some information that will be going out via email uh, for some benevolence work that is ongoing. <laughs> Uh, that, that we are involved in, specifically our sister Jenny Smith is involved in, and we would um, appreciate your help with that. There's a large list of birthdays. We've got lots of birthdays um, this week, so if you will, look at the, your bulletin and wish those folks a happy birthday. Uh, a couple of area events, uh, two gospel series that are going on. Uh, that Those details are in the bulletin as well. In regards to our sick, uh, Brother Bill's health is declining. Uh, as many of you know, Brother Bill has been sick for quite a while, um, and his health is declining. Uh, Sister Sylvia covets our prayers. Uh, she also welcomes visits. Uh, just call before you go so that uh, she can let you know whether it's a, a convenient or appropriate time uh, to go, And but she would welcome those visits. Um, Joe and Betty are here today but they want us to continue to pray for them uh, they've had some health issues that uh, that we need to uh, pray for our also sister barbara levi we want to continue to pray for sister barbara uh, pat blankenship had an mri last week but she is here this morning uh, she made it and she's back there so we want to want to uh, encourage her many of you know tina harris used to be a member here she's a member up on signal mountain i believe um, Tina has been going through some uh, uh, cancer situation, and um, she's going to be seeing a specialist here in Chattanooga. We want to continue to pray for Tina. Um, also, Bobby Moore's daughter-in-law, uh, Becky Moore, will be having a procedure soon. Uh, Vicki Smith's sister, Janet Kilgore, got good news about her carcinoma, so we want to continue to pray for that situation. And then Bobby Moore's brother, Larry Green, had a light stroke recently. Uh, we want to continue to pray for all of our sick and shut-in. Um, we have others 
that uh, are not on the sick list, but we want to continue to pray for all those that are affected due to, to health situations and other situations. This morning's worship service, uh, Charles Abels will lead singing, Jeff Strasner will have our opening prayer, Robert Smith will lead the, will preside over the Lord's Supper, the elder at the front is Brian Sorello, Brian is doing double duty, he's going to be the elder at the front and our speaker. Uh, and then closing prayer will be by Brother Aiden Neal. If you will, bow with me and let's prepare our minds for worship. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for so many things that we don't deserve, but yet through your love and mercy you provide for us. We thank you specifically this morning for the opportunity to worship you, to praise your name, to glorify you. And Father, we pray that everything we do this morning will be in accordance with your will, that it will be uh, such that it's very pleasing to you. Father, we pray for those who can't be with us but who are worshiping online. We pray that their worship will be acceptable in your sight as well. And Father, we come before you praying for those who are leading in worship this morning, that they will lead us in such a way that it will enhance worship and will help us to focus our minds and our hearts on you and on what you've done for us. Father, most of all, we want to thank you for Jesus Christ. We want to thank you for his submission to your plan. We want to thank you for his love for mankind. And we want to thank you for the example he set on the cross. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. encourage everyone to join in our song our worship and song this morning first song will be number 220 number 220 he lives i serve a risen savior he's in the world today i know that he is living whatever men may say i see his hand of mercy I hear his voice of cheer, and just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's marrow way. He lives, he lives. Salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives with him. I hold in all the world around me. I see his loving care, and though my heart grows weary. I never will despair. I know that he is leading through all the stormy blasts. The day of his appearing will come at last. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to import. You ask me how. Rejoice, rejoice, O Christian, lift up your voice and sing. Eternal hallelujah to Jesus Christ the King. The hope of all who seek Him, the help of all who find. None other is so loving, so good and kind. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. 
To prepare our minds for partaking of the Lord's Supper, we'll sing number five. Number five. A hill called Mount Calvary. There are thieves as we travel this earth shifting signs that transcend all the reason of man but the thief that matters the most in this world they can never be held in our hand I believe in a hill called Mount Calvary I'll believe whatever the cost. And when time has surrendered and earth is no more, I'll still cling to that old rugged cross. I believe. That the Christ who was slain on the cross Has the power to change life today For he changed me completely A new life is mine That is why by the cross I will I believe in the hill called Mount Calvary. I believe whatever the cost. And when time has surrendered and earth is no more, I'll still plead to I believe that this life with its great history Surely some day will come to an end Our faith will conquer the darkness and death And will lead me at last to my friend, I believe in a hill called Mount Calvary. I believe whatever the cause, and when time has surrendered and heard. Is no more. I'll still cling to that old rugged cross. Amen. Everyone will need a Lord's Supper packet to participate. If you forgot to get one when you came in, raise your hand and we'll bring one to you.
Everybody got one over here? Okay. As we prepare our minds to partake of the Lord's Supper, it's always important to remember that this is a commandment. 1 Corinthians 11, 24 says, And when he had given thanks, he break it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. As we look at Jesus' sacrifice, I think it's important to go back to the very beginning. Jesus left the majesty of heaven. John 6, 38 says, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Jesus, despite being divine, chose to take on human form and live a life of service and humility. Philippians 2, 5 through 7 says, have, in my, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. So Christ didn't resist the Father's will. In complete harmony, he volunteered to come as a servant as a man. A lot of people couldn't accept this because they envisioned some heroic conqueror, someone who would destroy the enemies with his mighty power, someone with riches and grandeur. Christ came wielding the power of love. As we look at his death, scripture teaches us that it was for our sins that he died. He didn't deserve to die. The just died for the unjust. His death was a vicarious substitutionary sacrifice for the sins of the world. His death was an atonement. He was the Passover lamb, atoning for the sins of mankind. The resurrection proved that his death was an atoning sacrifice, that it accomplished what it was to accomplish, that it authenticated all of Christ's claims. 1 Peter 2, 21-25 tells us, For to this you were called, since Christ also suffered for you to follow in his steps. He committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. When he was suffered, he threatened no retaliation, but committed himself to God who judges justly. He himself bore our sins on his body on the tree that we may cease from sinning to live for righteousness. By his wounds we were healed, for you were going astray like sheep, but now you have turned back to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. Romans 5 eight says, But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So we know the greatest show of love would be giving your life for someone. Jesus didn't just step in front of a firing squad or even be beheaded as traumatic and fearful that would be at the time, but he died a long, drawn-out, barbaric, inhumane death. He was given to the hands of the Romans who perfected pain. They relished in giving pain. The scourging alone saved the Romans many trees because many didn't survive that. Jesus did survive his scourging and was actually nailed to the cross, the worst form of crucifixion. But then we know that's not the end of the story because he was resurrected. Today the whole Christian world celebrates Christ's resurrection. Luke 24, 6-7 says, He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered to the hands of sinners. Be crucified and on the third day rise again. John 11, 25, 26. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. Whosoever lives by believing in me will never die. 1 Thessalonians 4.14 For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, 
So we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in Him. So many uplifting verses here. 1 Peter 1, through, 1 and 3. Praise be to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy He has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. In Romans 6, 5 through 6, For if we have been united with Him in a death like His, we will certainly be united with Him in a resurrection like His. For we know that our old self was crucified with Him, so that the body ruled by sin may be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Through Christ's sacrifice, His death and resurrection, He conquered death offering hope and eternal life to all that believe in Him and abide in His commandments. Let's give thanks for our bread. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that Christ did come to earth and showed us the way to live and died for our sins. And as we partake of this loaf, we pray that we'll do so in a manner pleasing to You, that we remember the cruelties that He suffered on our behalf. In Christ's holy name, amen. Continue with the cut. In like manner, Father, we continue remembering Jesus and the blood shed for our sins, knowing that because of his shed blood we have a chance at salvation. Our sins can be washed away and forgiven. Father, help us remember Christ deepest depths of our heart, Father, or the act of bravery for his commitment just leaving heaven, coming to earth and living a humble life that he lived saving us from our sins. In Christ's name we pray, amen. We always use this as a convenient time to honor another act of worship we're commanded to do, and that's having the opportunity to give support our church, support Christ and His Word, and hopefully we all do that, look at it as an opportunity, not as an obligation. Appreciate Brother Heath's prayer when he said that we're given a lot of things that we really don't deserve, and we now, I know are thankful that we're in the circumstances we're in. We look across the world, so much disaster, heartache, death, poverty, starvation. We're here today all in a different circumstance. Uh, all you got to do is look at our budget and see the many works that this church supports. Of course, not only the work here in Saudi, but across the, the world. Many places where most of us will never go to, but we can support Christianity in those areas. Our last of leaders and the parents that went with them, all the work we support with our youth, this all comes from our donations. So let's go to God in prayer for our blessings. Father, we are so thankful that we're born in this country, in this time, in this circumstance we find ourselves in, again, not deserving of all that we were given. We know that Anything we give back to you is given to us by you in the first place. And in a second, our, our circumstances could be much different. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity, for being able to have a part in many works that we don't directly participate in, but we can help through our generous donations, our loving gifts to you. We pray uh, that you'll continue to bless our elders and give them the wisdom to 
maximize these funds to further your word in the best way possible. Thank you again, Father, for our blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. You notice in the bulletin our lesson topic this morning will be the nature of faith and several of our song selections focus on faith. Prior to Brother Jeff coming and leading our opening prayer, we'll sing number 400, Living by Faith, number 400. I care not today what the morrow may bring, if shadow or sunshine or rain. The Lord I know ruleth for everything, and all of my worry is vain. Living by faith, living by faith in Jesus above, in Jesus above trusting confide. Living my faith, I'm living my faith, I feel no alone. Though tempests may blow and the storm clouds arise, obscuring the brightness of light, I'm never alarmed at the overcast sky. The master looks on at the strife. Living by faith, yes, living by faith, in Jesus above, in Jesus above, trusting can find, trusting can find, in His great love, yes, in His great love, from our homes, from our in His sheltering home, I'm living. And feel no alone. I know that he safely will carry me through, no matter what evils be tied. Why should I then care though the tempest may blow, if Jesus walks close to my side? If he my faith, in Jesus. Trusting, confiding in His great love, yes, in His great love. From our homes, in His sheltering home, I'm living by faith, I'm living by faith, I'm Let us pray together. Our dear Holy Father, thank you so much for the privilege we have to be here today to worship you. Father, we realize that this day is special. It's the first day of the week. We realize your son bought and paid for a church. And through that word that we read constantly, we understand that he would have us meet on the first day of the week to break bread together to worship you, to give glory, for you do deserve the glory and the worship that we give and much more. Father, we're so thankful for your church, the Saudi congregation. We're so thankful for all the many congregations that are spread across the world. We realize that all of these churches, these different congregations is one church in unity to worship you. Father, we're so blessed in this congregation to have believing elders, strong 
men who give up much to serve you, and they do so cheerfully, willingly, and in the hopes that they can help some poor soul to be saved. Father, if there's someone in this group today that has not named the name of Christ, has not come to baptism, and not been buried in water, some symbolically showing submission, commitment, and repentance, we pray that they would be urged to do so, if not today, soon, because we realize each day is a different day, and none are guaranteed. Father, we're so thankful for your love for us. We're thankful for your word, especially thankful for your son who came to this earth and gave his life for us that we might have a hope of salvation. And through his words, we find the way of salvation. We find faith. We find encouragement. We find joy. Father, we just find your love for us. We're so thankful, thankful that you're mindful of us, that you listen to our prayers, that we can come to you any time, any day, any hour, and we can beg for your forgiveness, we can beg for your mercy, and we can beg you just to lead us on the path that we should go. Father, we know not how to lead ourselves. We see that in your word and we understand that. We pray that you will continue to lead us. We pray that you will forgive us of our sins and trespasses as we repent of those and help us to live a life that is pleasing to you and encouragement to others around us. Father, we thank you for our elders. We thank you for our deacons. We thank you for our teachers, especially thankful for these men that are willing to stand up and proclaim your word to us and to the world. We're thankful for the opportunity that your, world, your word is preached even outside this, this building through social media and others can hear of it. And I pray that they will examine themselves to determine if they're headed toward heaven or elsewhere. Father, I pray that they would make the right decision. Father, we're mindful of those that can't be with us today through illness or sickness or traveling or, or whatever that might be. And we pray that you would be with each one of these and bless them. We realize that you're with each one of us because we have your spirit in us that dwells here. And we pray that that you would bless each one of them. Father, we have a list, a long list. Our brother Greer is declining in health, and, and we love him so much, and we love dear Miss Sylvia as well, and we pray for them and their family. We pray also for uh, Joe and Betty Varner, and we're so delighted to see them with us today that their health is such that they can be here and they can be a, a great example, a living example of of what prayer can do and, and what you can do. Father, we pray for Barbara Levi. We pray for Pat Blankenship, Tina Harris, Becky Moore, Janet Kilgore, Larry Green. And in addition to these, we pray for Nancy Marler, Terry Crabtree, and Yvonne. We pray for Vicki Smith, Debbie Fugit, and Brenda Shipley. Also pray for Brother Carl. We know he's going through difficult health issues as well, and he is such a great man, and we pray that you'll strengthen him and his family. Thank you so much for each one of these, Father. Father, we pray that you'll be with us as we continue to worship. We know that you are. We know your spirit's here in this place. We pray that we can worship you in a way that's pleasing to you. We pray that all things that we say and do here will be in accordance with your will. Thank you for your love. Thank you for being with us. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. When heaven's invitation is extended at the conclusion of our lesson this morning, we'll sing number 687 as a song of encouragement, 687. Prior to our lesson, let's sing number 134, number 134, Faith is a Victory. If you find it convenient, let's stand as we sing this song. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4. Encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers ride, and press the battle in the night, shall veil the glowing skies. Against the foe in veils below, let all our strength be who Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory. the world. 
His banner over us is love, our sword, the word of God. We tread the road, the saints above, with shouts of triumph trod. By faith they light the world with spread, spread on over every field. This faith by which they conquer death is still our shining shield. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory. White raiment shall begin Before the angels he shall know His name confessed in heaven Then onward from the hills of light Our hearts with love aflame Will vanquish all the hosts of night In Jesus' conquering name Faith is the victory, faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. Be seated, please. <clears throat> Good morning. Matthew 28, beginning in verse 1. Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning, and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him, and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, Come see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And indeed, he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples' word. Our Savior is risen. This is a day oftentimes in the, in the world and in the religious world where we see uh, people coming to worship God for they understand that Christ was our Savior and is our Savior and was risen from the dead. And it is an important day, every Lord's Day, as we remember the sacrifice that our Lord Jesus Christ made on our behalf so that you and I can have salvation. I want to talk to you this morning about the nature of faith. The nature of faith. What is faith? And what does it mean to believe? Well, some Christians think that it means blind acceptance. You've just got to believe something. Some skeptics agree that faith is believing in something without good reasons to do so. As Steven Pinker, an evolutionary psychologist who opposed mandatory religion classes at Harvard. But both of those statements are incorrect. That is, it is not a blind faith of acceptance that you've just got to believe something. And it is not believing something with no good reason to do so. For such ignorance of the nature of faith 
causes two things. One, it causes shallowness of faith among Christians. And number two, it causes prejudice against faith among skeptics. To avoid misunderstanding the nature of faith, especially the nature of Christian faith, we want to study this morning and examine both beginning with the nature of faith. What is the biblical definition of faith? Well, as defined in Easton's Bible Dictionary, faith is, a, in, general, is in general the persuasion of the mind that a certain statement is true. And the primary idea there is of trust. It is a strong conviction or a trust in something. The New English translation translates Hebrews chapter 11 in verse 1 like this. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for. The New King James Version says it this way. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Things that we can be convinced of what we do not see. We can be convinced of something that we do not see. You believe in oxygen, don't you? But you can't see it. We can see the results of oxygen because we all know that human beings have to have oxygen to live. And there are other animals on the earth that have to have oxygen to live. We believe in something we do not see. For example, you have faith that your parents are indeed your parents. Or, and that's based upon your confidence and the reliability of them telling you that they're your parents. You weren't there when you were born. I mean, you weren't there in understanding uh, when you were born. You were there when you were born, weren't you, Marshall? <laughs> Such conviction or trust prompts us to respond accordingly. We trust our parents, we trust their word, just as we should trust God and his word. We have such faith or trust and conviction in many different things. We believe that George Washington lived one day in the past, but we weren't there to see that, were we? We believe in commercial aviation as a safe way to travel. Faith is trust or conviction in something or someone. The evidentiary nature of faith can be seen. Many people believe that faith is something blind. You just got to believe. Yes, faith can be a conviction in things unseen, as we saw in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1. Yes, we can walk by faith and not by sight. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7 tells us, For we walk by faith, not by sight. There can be sound reasons, that is, evidence for believing in what you cannot see. Just as we said, you believe that George Washington lived, though you've never seen him. And just as you believe in who your parents are, though you can't remember who was there at your birth. Other people believe that faith is a special gift from God for a select few. In one sense of faith is indeed a gift from God. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8 tells us, For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves this is a gift of God. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 3, For I say through the faith given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. While faith owes its ultimate source to God, it is available to everyone. For God desires that all men be saved. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 through 6. For this is a good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved. That is mankind, all men to be saved, to come to knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all, to be testified in due time he desires that which produces saving faith to be proclaimed to all. 
Our theme for Lads to Leaders this year was, um, I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. Are we ashamed? The fact is that faith comes from evidence provided by God himself. And I'm just going to give you just a few of the ones that are inspiring to me. One, evidence of his existence in the universe. Psalms chapter 19, verses 1 through 3. If you have your Bibles, turn over there for a moment. We're going to read that. Then we're going to talk about some other evidences that are there for us to believe that God is who he says he is. Psalms chapter 19, beginning in verse 1, and I'm reading from the New King James Version. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utter speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. From creation itself, we can see a designer. Therefore, we can have a faith that we have a designer, a creator of all things. Take, for instance, the honeybee. Have you ever considered the honeybee and how they're successful in what they do and why they do the things that they do? One, honeybees are pollinators and they're necessary for plant life to survive upon earth. An interesting thing happens that many people don't understand or, or don't think about and that is something that I've only learned recently is that as honeybees leave their hive to go out seeking nectar so that they can bring that nectar back to the hive and produce more bees and more honey those bees hear the flowers singing now think about that for a minute flowers conduct a sound to the bees so that that flower is basically singing and saying I have nectar come to me and they attract the bee by that singing that they that they have and if you hook up certain electrical instruments to those flowers you can actually hear that song that the bees hear from the flowers it's interesting the flower has a positive charge and the bee has a negative charge and as the bee lands on that flower to collect nectar the opposite charges cause that pollen to be attached to the bee so as the bee is, a, is getting nectar for its job the pollen attaches to the bee's body oftentimes its legs and the bee goes on to another flower to pollinate that flower and to collect more nectar. Now another interesting thing about this is the fact that after the nectar is gotten from that particular flower, that flower changes its song. It changes its song so that the bee knows not to go to that particular flower because it does not have nectar to provide that bee. That is absolutely amazing to me, that God created nature like that. When we think about the human eye and the things that we're able to do with the human eye and the color spectrum that we can see and all of the wonderful things that we see um, as the creation on earth, we can have faith to know that God is our creator and our designer. Romans chapter 1, verses 19 and 20, because what may have been known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse of signs and wonders so we might believe in the son in his son John 5 and verse 36 John 10 verses 37 and 38 
John 14, verses 10 and 11, and John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. Faith in the Bible is not blind faith. It is trust based on evidence. Trust based on evidence. Oftentimes when uh, I have a complaint of an employee uh, that comes to me at work, uh, I always say, trust but verify. I trust that they're bringing me a complaint, but I always want to verify what they're saying, right? Because there's always two sides of the story, right? I say a pancake's flat, but it has two sides, right? So you have to look into and find the evidence of things that you may not be privy to at that particular time to solve a particular situation. The same is true for our faith in God. We look for the evidence of things not seen. And that is how our faith is produced. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1. So let's look then at the nature of Christian faith. The nature of Christian faith. Well, one, the nature of Christian faith is one that is rational and intelligent faith. It is rational and intelligent. God expects us to use our minds, does he not? Matthew chapter 22, verses 36 through 38. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. God expects us to think. He expects us to use our minds. We do not have to commit intellectual suicide by having a faith in God because we have evidences that are there in order for us to believe that God is who he says he is and that he can do what he says he can do. I am grateful for my heart cannot rejoice in what my mind rejects. Indeed, a weak faith is the result of a heart trying to believe what the mind rejects. Does this mean that we as Christians can have 100% proof that God is who he says he is? Well, I believe it can, but technically, no. But oftentimes in life, we commit 100% on something we can't guarantee 100%. As when flying on an airplane, no 100% guarantee that plane's going to continue to fly, but we 100% commit anyway when we get on the plane. Because the safety of commercial aviation makes it rational and an intelligent decision to do so. So the question becomes, is there enough evidence to warrant making a 100% commitment to Christ? I believe there is. Certainly enough to commit myself 100% for him rather than be 100% against him. There is no other alternative for you're for him or you're against him. Jesus is like an airplane. Either we get on board totally or we get left behind. The Christian faith is based on making rational and intelligent decisions of nature, of creation, of God's word, and looking at it in its entirety to understand that we indeed can have a rational and an intelligent faith. Next, it is a historical and factual faith. Christianity appeals to history and the facts of history. The facts backing the Christian claim are not a special kind of religious fact. They are the cognitive informational facts upon which all historical, legal, and ordinary decisions are based. That's a quote from Charles Pinnock. 
Notice the historical reference of time, places, people, and events. Take your Bible and turn with me to the book of Luke. The book of Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census took place while Quandrius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. Turn over to chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Now on the 15th day of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod, I'm sorry, being of Judea, Herod being tetriarch of Galilee, his brother Philip tetri tetriarch of Enturia, and the region of, I always have such a hard time with these proper names, when, Anna, when Annas and Sapphira were high priests, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. Now, why do I mention all those things? There are many historical references to time, places, and events mentioned in the Bible. Thus, it is not faith based on philosophy or myths or legend but based on history and facts. The Christian faith is based on facts of history. Next, it is an objective faith. Faith or trust in an object that is Jesus of Nazareth. Faith in who he is, who he was, the Christ, the Son of God. Faith in what he did, he arose from the dead on the third day. It does not make a difference what we believe. The old cliche, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you believe in something, is inconsistent with the Christian faith. It is not a faith in of itself that is important, but in whom the object of our faith truly is. John chapter 8. And verse 24, the Christian faith is trust or conviction in the person of Jesus Christ. It is trust and conviction to understand that he can indeed deliver us from our sins by the sacrifice that he made on the cross. It is an evidentiary faith. That is, we have evidence for our faith. A faith or conviction or trust based on evidence. Evidence such as eyewitnesses. Notice, if you will, John chapter 1, or 1 John chapter 1, I'm sorry. 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. That which we was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard we declare to you that you may also have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. We have evidence that Jesus Christ was who he says he was. The same sort of evidence used in a court of law. 
basing convictions on credible eyewitnesses as we see here in 1 John chapter 1 verses 1 through 4 they saw they heard they touched our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ evidence such as fulfilled in prophecy flip over to the book of Acts chapter 17 Acts chapter 17 verses 2 and 3 Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of Jews, then Paul, as his custom, was, he went to them and for these and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and raise again from the dead and saying, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and a great multitude of devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women joined Paul and Silas. Evidence can be seen of Christ and him existing and living on earth. Based on the improbability of over 300 fulfilled prophecies being coincidence is very likely not the case. When just eight prophecies from the Bible and their fulfillment are considered, the likelihood of coincidence is 1 in 10 to the 17th power. That's a lot of zeros. With just 48 prophecies, the probability is 1 in 10 to the 157th power. I can't even count that high. It is virtually impossible for us to have the word of God as we do with the evidence of things not seen with the evidence of things being made clear to us that Jesus is the Christ the son of the living God the Christian faith is based on such evidence we have seen that the nature of faith, in particular the Christian faith, is trust and, in it, and is intelligent and rational. Trust in a person of history, Jesus of Nazareth. Trust in who he is and what he did. Trust based on empirical and reasonable evidence. Faith or trust does not lead to believing in things not seen such as God who is invisible, John 1, 18. Such as promises we hope to receive resurrection and eternal life, Romans chapter 8 and verse 24. But such faith is not blind credibly. There is solid evidence for such faith, faith in Jesus Christ, which in turn leads us to trust in things not seen. Only those ignorant of the evidence ridicule faith or find themselves wavering in their own faith. Examine the evidence and believe. As we read, as we began our lesson this morning, Matthew chapter 28, verses 6 and 7, for our Savior has risen. Jesus Christ was a man. God came in the flesh to minister to those on earth to let us know what new will and testament was being brought forth because of the failure of mankind to believe God and to trust God and to continue to have their faith in God. Man has separated himself from God because of sin. Sin separates us from God even today. But if we 
are obedient to God's plan of salvation, we can have forgiveness of sins, removal of sins, and be in the right standing with God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We must hear the word of God, believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Repent of your sins. Stop sinning on purpose. Have that change of mind. Acts chapter 17 and verse 30. For the time of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands every man everywhere to repent. Confess with the mouth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and be buried in a watery grave of baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. If you've already done these things and you've fallen away from God, you've lost your faith for some reason, Oftentimes, when we're going through difficult situations in life, we turn away from God and we begin to blame Him for things that happen. We don't understand why God allows suffering on earth. I'll tell you why God allows suffering on earth, because this is not our permanent home. We have a home where there's no tears, no sorrow, but joy and eternal life with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit for eternity. If you are a person who has already obeyed the gospel plan of salvation and perhaps have committed a public sin that needs public repentance, or you need the prayers and thoughts of your brothers and sisters in Christ for something you may be suffering with or having to deal with, we offer you an invitation to come forward now as together we stand and as we sing. To trust in Jesus, just to in word, just to rest upon His promise, just to know the says the Lord, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I prove Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust his cleansing blood just in simple faith to plunge me neath the healing cleansing blood Jesus, Jesus how I trust how I prove him more and more Jesus, Jesus precious Jesus Oh, for grace to trust Him more. Yes, tis sweet to trust in Jesus, just from sin and self to cease. Just from Jesus, simply taking life and rest and joy and peace. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I prove Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust Thee. Precious Jesus, Savior, friend, and I know that Thou art with me, will be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I prove Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more.
Again, it's been good for us to be here today. You're visiting with us. We appreciate you. We hope that you'll come back at any opportunity you might have. We will not be having lunch between services today. We recognize that many people will be with their families, but we encourage everyone to be back at 1.30 this afternoon for our fifth Sunday singing. And we would very much appreciate that. Also, Wednesday night at 7 p.m. for our midweek Bible study. Closing song will be number 68. Number 68, we'll sing the first and last verses, then Brother Aiden will dismiss us in prayer. Because he lives. God sent his son, they called him Jesus. He came to love, heal and forgive. He lived and died to buy my pardon. And empty grave is there to prove my Savior lived. Because he lived, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know. And life is worth a living just because he lived. And then one day I'll cross the river, I'll fight my spine, war with pain. And then as death gives way to victory, I'll see the lights of glory and I'll know he lives because he lives I can face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone because I know he holds the and life is worth a living just because he lives. Amen.